Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome uh, uh, back to our Trade, Trade Commissioner Market Update Series. Today's webinar is entitled Russia's and Kazakhstan's Education Sectors Today, International Education Market Updates, Trends, and Development. Again, my name is Tom Wan, and I'm the manager of market support and partnership development at the BC Council for International Education. Thank you very much for joining us today on what promises to be a great opportunity to learn updates about the education sector from two Eastern European countries, Russia and Kazakhstan. Today's webinar is co-hosted by BCCIE and Trade Commissioner Service, Global FS Canada. Before we get started, and prior to introducing our presenters, it is important I acknowledge that we live and work on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples of Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. Now on to a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is, will be followed by Q&A, and attendees will be muted during the webinar. If you have any questions for our panelists, or if you need any technical support, you can use the question box in the control panel to submit your questions. For the questions to our panelists, we will try to get to this at the end of our discussion, and my colleague Luke from the back end will help to answer your inquiries about technical support. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters for this morning. Elena Batilova, Operations Unit Supervisor, Migration Section, Embassy of Canada in Moscow. Alexandra Konisheva, Trade Commissioner, Education and Culture uh, Industries at the Embassy of Canada in Moscow as well. And Nathan License, Counselor, Commercial and Senior Trade Commissioner from the Embassy of Canada in North Southern. And uh, this morning, we also have Stephanie Luwazu, Deputy Trade Program Manager and Counselor from the Embassy of Canada in Moscow. And uh, here are some sh short bios for our presenters this morning. Elena has been working at the migration section of the Canadian Embassy in Moscow more than 25 years. At present, she is the operations unit supervisor. As such, Elena oversees visa application processing operations and coordination with the visa application centers. The migration sessions of the Canadian Embassy in Moscow covers six countries, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Alexandra, Alexandra, Konisheva is the Trade Commissioner at the Canadian Embassy in Moscow, covering culture, educational, and ICT sectors. Prior to her joining Embassy in February of 2010, she held a varied variety of positions at the leading Russian educational institutions. For example, she was responsible for marketing of educational programs and international students recruitment at the National University of Science and Technology and served at the International Affairs Office at the Russian Academy of Public Administration, being in charge of international executive education programs for Russian public officials and businessmen. During her career, Alexandra also consulted foreign universities on assessing uh, the Russian education market. Alexandra holds a bachelor degree in public administration from Moscow State University and a master's degree in public administration from Leiden University in Netherlands. Nathan Lysons uh, joined the Global Affairs Canada in 2007. At headquarters, he worked in several uh, services trade policy and was a senior trade policy officer in the Trade Policy Asia Division. He has also served as a trade commissioner in the defense and security and ICT sector teams. Overseas, he has served at the embassy to Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyz Republic, and Tajikistan, initially as 
Second Secretary, Commercial and Trade Commissioner before his current role. He holds Bachelor of Art degree honors in history from the University of Alberta and Master of Art degree International Affairs from the Carleton University. Now, please allow me to turn over the floor to our first presenter, Elena. And I will invite you, Elena, to share your screen. Yeah, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak in front of you. Uh, and I will present uh, the uh, most recent updates on the student visa processing. Uh, so, as we mentioned, we cover six countries, unlike our uh, trade uh, commissioner officers who only cover two countries each. Um, so, it means that the uh, residents of uh, these countries, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, if residents of these countries apply for a Canadian visa, uh, they, uh, the applications are processed by the Embassy of Canada in Moscow. Uh, to be noted, though, that we cooperate with our colleagues at the Embassy of Canada in Warsaw, and we share the work workload from our territory. Uh, also, our colleagues in Warsaw are in charge of most of the correspondence with our clients. It means that uh, if you uh, receive an answer from uh, Warsaw, uh, don't be surprised if you're kidding. Um, if you need information about visas to Canada, of course, you should turn to official website. And uh, you can see them on the uh, screen right now. First of all, it's uh, uh, the IRCC website. And these days, uh, the CBSA website uh, became very important uh, too, because they will cover the most detailed information about travel restrictions and uh, border uh, restrictions and requirements for travelers. Uh, so what, in March, uh, the life almost paralyzed, was paralyzed. Uh, uh, Canada introduced the travel restrictions for foreign nationals as uh, did many other countries. Um, uh, the visa, visa processing has always stopped. Uh, uh, new applications for visitor visas were no longer accepted. Uh, a lot has changed since then. Um, uh, and I will describe well, where we stand right now. Uh, I will only talk about uh, the visas uh, in the context of students. So visitor visas are important to us because they are required for short-term studies uh, uh, under six months. And uh, they are also required uh, for returning students. I mean, those students who have a valid study permit uh, but uh, do not have a valid visa to travel with. Uh, so, uh, traveling for short-term studies is still not possible, unfortunately, and uh, these studies should be uh, postponed. Uh, however, returning students uh, have the right to, uh, uh, to apply for a visa and uh, be processed and likely to travel. Um, so new applications for visitor visas can only be submitted online following special procedures if one is exempt from travel restriction. However, if someone wants to apply for a visa in advance, uh, they are not exempt from travel restrictions right now, but uh, they want to have a visa by the time when uh, the travel restrictions are lifted. Um, new applications can be submitted even now, but uh, in a regular way. Um, Study permits are required for studies uh, for the duration of more than six months. Uh, new applications are only submitted online. Um, and uh, the recently a two-stage processing was introduced. I will talk about it later. Uh, biometrics are still not possible in our territory because the visa application center in the parks are still closed to the public. However, if uh, a client happens to be in a third country uh, and uh, there is a fact that it's open to public, uh, they can submit the biometrics in any country. And it's not only now, it's the general rule. Uh, however, if uh, the biometrics uh, are taken in a third country, additional fees may be required. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, any interaction with public may only happen by a point this day. As far as we know, most panel physicians have uh, resumed their operations, so clients are encouraged to contact the clinic directly to book an appointment. Uh, it's uh, better to do it than the territory of most of the jurisdiction for logistical purposes. Uh, if someone has a, a passport request uh, letter, um, if they uh, live in Russia, they can submit uh, their passport uh, because two visa application centers open on the 21st of September uh, and they uh, can accept passports uh, by mail only though, uh, but it's possible. So today we receive, we receive more than 200 passports for visa printing, so uh, it's very encouraging. Things are going back to normal. We expect more bags to open uh, soon, so follow the news uh, on the websites, uh, the EFF Global website and the RSC website. Uh, it's possible that uh, even as early as next week, two new bags will be uh, open. Uh, one in Russia, and uh, we hope that uh, one uh, is application center in Kazakhstan may open. So let's cross out. Um, uh, as it is with biometrics, the same with the passport submissions, uh, they can be submitted at any nearest bag. Uh, I don't mean that passports can be mailed to any bag uh, in the third country. No, this is not possible. But if, again, someone happens to be in a third country uh, and there is a bag that is uh, close by and uh, it's convenient to submit the passport there, uh, it is possible to do it. Um, but again, a uh, passport, a mailing passport uh, to a third country is not allowed. The embassies in Moscow and in Warsaw have resumed operations too, with reduced schedule and reduced staff though, but we ensure almost uh, daily presence in the office, which is also Deadlines for all requests uh, are issued by visa officers offices have been extended from 30 to 90 days, and again to other 90 days, and so on. But it's not required to submit individual requests for extensions. Uh, they're extended automatically. However, as soon as uh, the VAC or uh, panel position or the embassy uh, opens, uh, uh, the deadlines are sort of deactivated uh, and the clients are encouraged to follow all the updates on uh, our website uh, and to comply with the requirements as soon as they see that uh, it is visible. However, until it's not visible, uh, no refusals uh, for non-compliance will be uh, issued. Uh, hello, uh, Alex. This is Tom. Sorry to interrupt you, but we have audience mentioned that your voice is uh, is muffled. I just wonder if you could get closer to your speaker. Maybe that will help a little bit. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Is it better this way? Yes, I think it's better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the following factors uh, will show that things are going back to normal. Uh, well, ability to travel depends on the exit restrictions from the uh, country of residence. Um, but we know that uh, uh, students from Russia and from Kazakhstan are allowed to travel for study uh, abroad. Um, whether Canada will uh, change the travel restrictions and the quarantine requirement, we'll know on the 1st of November. I don't expect, expect these requirements to be lifted, but we hope very much that they will be solved. At least uh, if we speak about the travel restrictions. And we see that they are being solved even before this date. But on the 1st of November, there should be uh, an update uh, uh, on the general, in general, not only for students. Uh, and uh, well, the back. Uh, and the clinics and the embassies reopening follow the news as well. Uh, now let's talk about the travel restrictions. 
uh, as you know, they are not governed by RSCC, but uh, they are moved by orders in council. But if it's any rule, there are exemptions. Uh, however, if someone is exempt from travel restriction, they are not uh, exempt from a visa requirement. So visa and a permit are still required. If someone doesn't have it, uh, they should apply for one. Uh, and they should present a full kit. Uh, if they can submit a document, an explanation should be uh, imposed. Um, just to remind you that Canadian biometrics are valid for 10 years. It means that they should not be repeated while they are still valid and new these applications can be done, uh, can be submitted without uh, submitting new biometrics. All travelers are encouraged to upload the right can mobile application to submit mandatory information in advance. And this is good to do it in advance to so the travelers know what exactly will be required. Uh, so they're not caught by surprise that will arrive in Canada. Uh, for example, contact information in Canada is one of the uh, mandatory uh, pieces of information that is uh, required. Uh, a valid visa is not uh, sufficient these days uh, for, uh, to travel to Canada. Uh, airlines uh, uh, have the mandate to verify not only the visa validity but also where the clients are indeed exempt from travel restrictions. So clients should identify themselves uh, uh, at check-in and present supporting documents to prove that they are indeed exempt from travel restrictions. The same will be repeated upon arrival in Canada in front of CBSA officers. And quarantine officers will um, check uh, the traveler's quarantine plan. This is a very important element. Um, and uh, I know that uh, the DLIs have done a tremendous work in developing this quarantine plan for the uh, students. So I think you know about it more than I do. Uh, but thank you for this work. It's, uh, it was, I think, a keystone uh, facilitating students to travel. So now let's talk about uh, the actual exemptions. Um, but, uh, so for people who want to travel uh, uh, from now before the 20th of October, so within the next five days, the following rules will apply. Uh, the visa, the issuance of study permit, uh, date of issuance of study permit is important. Um, we talk about the 18th of March, which is the threshold for uh, decision making on uh, the ability to travel. So holders uh, with study permits issued before the 18th of March may be allowed to enter Canada if they prove that they're uh, purpose of their travel is essential or non-optional, non-discretional. Three terms I think on our website. Uh, and uh, uh, a detailed supporting letter from uh, a DLI is highly recommended to help the student to check in and then to uh, go to the uh, CPSA control on the arrival. The supporting letter from the DLI should indicate why the student must be present in person in Canada, why they cannot pursue their studies online from abroad. Um, because uh, the visa, even if the study permit is issued before the 18th of March, the entry may not be allowed if uh, the uh, reasons for travel will not be considered as essential. Uh, for example, uh, if the travel can be delayed or if the studies can be done online, if the studies were cancelled or postponed, then the boarding and the entry to Canada will be denied. Uh, holders of visas they should be after the 18th of March and not allowed to travel at this time. Yeah. However, things will change on the 20th of October. And I should uh, confess that uh, today is the, one of the most awkward day, uh, days to uh, speak about it because uh, some of the updates have been announced, but not all of them. Not all the details have uh, been announced officially yet. And I have a draft of uh, uh, future 
uh, exemptions uh, for students, but uh, I'm not sure what the, the final wording will be. So I'm, I'm hesitant about uh, uh, giving you the uh, misleading, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I may be misleading in my message. Therefore, I will be very cautious. Um, and I will only talk about what I know uh, for sure. So for sure, uh, the date of issuance, the issuance date of the study permits will not, would no longer be relevant. Uh, this was announced by the minister. Um, and uh, the entry may be allowed if a student uh, uh, is going to attend a DLI, uh, which has a COVID readiness plan approved by their province. Um, whether the purpose of travel uh, being essential or not will be assessed under, after the 20th of October, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but uh, if, it's, if this requirement is removed, so be it, it's good. If it stays, you know what it is. So please follow the updates on our website and uh, if this requirement stays, um, just remember that uh, a detailed supporting letter from the DLI will uh, be highly encouraged to help the students to board the plane, plane and then to enter Canada upon arrival. Um, so a few words about the processing of these applications. Uh, as you know, uh, well, I mean, what many of you know that uh, the two-stage processing was introduced for studies that uh, began in 2020 uh, and the, for the applications that were submitted before the 15th of September. Uh, the processing was divided into two stages, eligibility and admissibility. Uh, on the eligibility review, uh, it was assessed whether the client qualified as a student. So we reviewed whether they have an adequate uh, update, up to date letter of acceptance, if they have enough money, uh, whether adult students um, have a bona fide motivation, etc. Uh, a preliminary decision was, was taken upon uh, review, uh, was called approval in principle, uh, with no guarantee of the final approval, but we still gave some reassurance to students uh, about potential final decision um, and so they could start uh, studies online from abroad. Uh, the admissibility review included the other mandatory steps like uh, submitting biometrics, medical examination, etc. And the final decision will be made when travel restrictions are lifted. Um, so, no, uh, so clients knowing themselves uh, whether they have any problems with uh, immigration uh, in the past, uh, whether the biometrics will be problematic or not, whether their health condition uh, is uh, rather problematic or not. So they were able to forecast the final decision from it. For applications submitted after the 15th of September, uh, there hasn't been any mechanism uh, uh, in place yet, and hopefully it won't be required. Uh, however, for any uh, study permit application in process, any updates are mandatory, uh, such as change of the format of education, or change of start date, or change of the program, etc. Uh, clients must submit uh, all updates via RCC web form or by email. So we hope that uh, the DLIs uh, will help our students uh, to present this information to us. Uh, a few words about the post-graduation uh, work permit eligibility, which is uh, which has also undergone many stages uh, um, and it was softened and uh, more and more. And finally, well, by now, uh, it was decided that uh, studies, uh, online studies uh, are allowed until the end of April next year, provided that uh, the studies began in 2020 or in January 2021, that a study permit application was submitted before 
study a program. If at least 50% of a program was eventually completed in Canada, and the students have been actually approved by the permit. Uh, an exception to this uh, is one year program because uh, it's impossible by now, it's clear that it's impossible to comply with the 50% uh, uh, requirement. Uh, and uh, uh, these uh, programs can be uh, entirely completed online from abroad uh, without affecting uh, the uh, post graduation work permit being affected. Uh, it concerns the one year programs uh, which started between May and September this year. Uh, students in Canada, just one uh, comment, uh, they should fix uh, their status uh, uh, as soon as a, a change occurs. For example, if uh, they have to stop their study because their program was closed or suspended or the DLI closed, they uh, have three options. Either they find a new DLI, they enroll a new program and they extend their student status, or they can change their status to either worker or visitor. Uh, if they find a job or if they don't find anything, they can stay as a visitor. Or they can, if they don't do either one or two, they should go to the third option, they should leave Canada. And of course, they should watch uh, their passport validity, which is uh, because so all these stages require the um, passport. All updates uh, on uh, how visas are affected by COVID uh, uh, can be found on our website. I encourage you to follow the news and uh, especially these days between today and the 20th of October uh, when uh, further updates on students uh, will be published, I hope. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll be glad to answer your questions if you have any. I think the Q&A session will be Thank you. Thank you, Elena, uh, for your great presentation. And our next uh, presenter will be Alex. Now we invite Alex to share your screen with our audience. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for introduction, Tom. Um, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to make a brief presentation on Russian education sector. I try to squeeze it into 20 minutes. I'll start with a brief overview of the educational system, um, then um, quickly touch on Russian students' international mobility, and then also talk about the opportunities for recruitment, uh, marketing, entry strategies, and um, quickly um, end up with some possible advice on marketing at entry strategies. So, um, Russia at glance, um, big country, vast territory, um, many big cities with a population over 1 million residents and with big uh, students' populations as well. Um, Russia has strong uh, federal education standards um, um, and boasts one of the highest rates of post-secondary um, education in the world. Um, all aspects of the Russian education system are reflected in the federal law on education, which is relatively new uh, from 2012. Um, it, um, among others, it um, proclaims the main principles of the Russian education system, which are equality of all citizens in obtaining secondary and higher education, and autonomous and secular nature of all public educational institutions functioning in the country. Um, there is also a national strategic project, a project on education, uh, which was recently launched by President Putin. And the main um, goal of this project is to ensure um, competitive, global competitiveness of the Russian education um, and making Russia one of the top 10 countries in the world in terms of quality of general education. Since one of the main goals of the, pro um, of the project is uh, making the education system globally competitive 
internationalization um, of education, especially higher education, is very high on the agenda of many educational institutions nowadays, which are looking for various international partnerships and cooperation with foreign universities. Uh, Russian educational system is um, very centralized. Um, education in Russia is organized and coordinated by the state, which ensures that general education is free and available for everyone. Uh, the responsibility is pretty much split between two ministries, Ministry of Science and Higher Education, which manages universities and research institutions, and Ministry of Education, which oversees school education. Um, there is also a sort of watchdog um, federal agency, Federal Service for Supervision and Education of Science, which performs various control and oversight in education, and among others, gives accreditation to all education programs in the country. So these are pretty much the numbers of the Russian um, education in terms of institutions and students attending them. Uh, Russian education system is a, um, is a mix, is a combination of public and private institutions. However, as you can see, um, looking at these numbers, um, public entities by far outnumber the private ones. It's especially <clears throat> obvious, um, especially yeah, but um, if we look at schools where private schools account for roughly two percent of all um, school um, of all schools in the country, uh, there are also international schools among these um, private schools. There are very few, but they do exist. They mainly located in the big Russian cities. It would be probably fair to say that they mainly located in Russia and Saint Petersburg. Um, education in, in Russia is compulsory for children between um, age um, 6 and 15, with primary school education for ages 6 from 6 to 10, followed by a senior school. Um, at the age of 15, kids may opt to enter a vocational school or non-university institute. Uh, should they decide to... <coughs> excuse me, get high education, they need to stay two more years at secondary school and then um, get and then apply for a university or any other high institution. Um, every school has a core curriculum of academic subjects and foreign language is among compulsory subjects in Russian schools. Um, English is the most popular foreign language. Um, French would be the second most popular, followed by German and Spanish. Russian is the language of instruction, with the exception of language courses or some private schools offering English language under some foreign um, curricula, such as IB program. Um, there are state compulsory exams after the 9th and 11th grade, respectively. So, just a few words about high education system in Russia. Um, it's mainly um, a two-level high education system, bachelor and master. However, we um, do still have um, a specialist degree. It's um, a legacy of the Soviet times when it was the only high education degree with a duration of study of five years. It still exists and coexists with uh, bachelor and master degrees. And in some areas, like in some engineering, for instance, um, areas, uh, specialist degrees is still um, awarded instead of uh, bachelor degrees. So this is how the um, education, the graduates, um, market in Russia looks like, uh, mainly bachelors, then masters and specialists. Um, COVID-19, um, of course, had a huge impact on the educational sector. 
Uh, Russia was among the most affected countries in terms of number of cases detected. All educational institutions, schools um, and universities um, switched to the online mode starting end of March. It was um, by ministerial degree. Uh, <clears throat> some of them return to offline mode, some of them uh, perform sort of like a hybrid mode, mode offline and online. Um, some uh, hasn't been able to resume um, online classes, but now as the country is hit by the second wave, um, <clears throat> lots of educational institutions are going online again. And the situation is changing on a daily basis and it hugely depends on the region because the epidemic situation is very different with Moscow being the most affected city, and the most affected region in the country. So um, the online education um, caused lots of problems and raised lots of concerns um, among parents and students alike. Um, lower education quality, among others, lower education quality comparing to in-class teaching, uh, <clears throat> inadequate internet connection, which sometimes uh, made online study next to impossible, lack of necessary computer equipment, which was cited as a problem by many families. Um, the standardized state exams were scheduled and it was um, it has its impact on the application cycle. However, the universities managed to <coughs> excuse me, managed to um, do the enrollment and um, uh, in time and start their classes in September. However, many of them are going online again. One of the main problems, of course, is the significant drop in the revenues suffered by the domestic universities and the projected decrease in international students' enrollment. Uh, there are currently around um, 300,000 international students studying in Russia, and they are a significant source of income for many universities. So decrease in international students would have a obvious impact on the <clears throat> revenues of universities and the ability to function properly. Um, the private educational sector suffered most and has been challenged most because they suffered the same significant drops in revenues. However, unlike public institutions, um, they were not subject to any um, assistance from the government. So they're struggling on their own pretty much. Um, government introduced um, some measures to support um, the educational sector in these um, rather turbulent times. They allocated a um, big chunk of my money mainly to support educational um, institutions, mainly salaries um, for university teachers. Uh, they also created over um, 30,000 state-funded places for students. Around 40% uh, of Russian students are state-funded. They um, um, study free of charge, around 60% pay fees. But the tendency is towards the decrease of state-funded places. However, COVID changed the situation towards the government assistance and um, increasing state-funded places. They mainly um, went to regional universities, and their emphasis was on medical and engineering programs. Uh, there were also a few changes introduced to education loans to make it more accessible to students. So, um, moving to mobility of Russian students abroad. Over the past 15 years, studying abroad has become very popular among Russians. Um, the main drivers include <clears throat> a developing middle class, uh, greater career mobility, um, growth in demand uh, for graduates of foreign universities. 
Uh, there are many international country, uh, companies working in Russia, uh, Russian companies trying to enter foreign markets. Graduates of foreign universities are in big demand. Um, <clears throat> also, a good comment of foreign language, English language especially, is one of the main requirements posed by the leading um, Russian companies to its employees. Uh, the number of Russian students abroad increased um, five times since um, 2000, and today there are approximately 57,000 Russian students studying abroad. Um, this number reflects the <clears throat> students going abroad to get a degree. So the actual number is actually greater because this one doesn't count um, students going on short-term programs, on language courses, and so on. So this is um, how the um, enrollments of Russian students by, um, by countries looks like. Um, the five top destinations remain the same over the year. Um, Canada is among top ten. Um, the popularity of um, the leading countries can be partly explained by the um, affordable tuition fees, availability of various scholarships, um, geographical proximity to Russia and some um, sometimes serious efforts undertaken by um, foreign universities from the listed countries in recruiting on the Russian market. Um, Canada, as I mentioned, is in top 10 um, destination and has been there for years. Uh, it has its strong competitive advantages which are affordable tuition fees, especially comparing to the US and Great Britain, uh, bilingual education system, uh, high quality of life, safe campuses, good healthcare system, which is becoming more and more of an issue um, whenever decision-making process um, comes to place and more importantly, opportunities to work after graduation, which are very much taken into account by um, Russian um, students and their parents while choosing the country to continue their education. Um, opportunities for students' recruitment. Um, uh, first of all, primary um, and secondary schools. Um, Boarding schools are popular among um, a certain Russian demographic and Canadian boarding schools are represent a good mix of uh, quality and value comparing to more expensive options from other countries. Um, however, there is um, a demographic in Russia that will um, prefer um, UK and Swiss, Swiss options, also partly because of um, geographical proximity of these two countries um, to Russia. Um, English language uh, training, various schools and courses are in great demand. They've been in great demand. They'll be in great demand for the foreseeable future. Um, good um, language skills could lead to greater um, employment. Um, young generation speaks English, but the quality of language skills varies considerably. Um, in this segment, there is a strong competition from the UK, US, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, however, <clears throat> as I said, Canada has its strong competitive advantages, and this is a very popular segment for study. Uh, French language training is also um, um, valued for students interested um, in working for various multinational companies. Um, the main competitors um, in this market are institutions from France, um, Switzerland, and Belgium. Uh, various undergraduate programs are also popular. There is um, <clears throat> a strong demand for undergraduate level programs, especially programs in engineering, um, life sciences, math, computer sciences, and um, business. Some are programs, short-term programs that allow students time to refine their language skills are also popular. University graduate and PhD programs 
are also in demand and uh, always attract a great deal of interest. Um, there is also, a, again, strong interest in physical science, engineering and business programs in this segment of the market. Um, market entry uh, considerations. Um, so um, Russia has limited commercial activity due to sanctions. Um, however, the education sector um, hasn't been suffered directly from that. Uh, students go to study abroad. Uh, there are partnerships between Russian and Canadian universities, so the sector has not been majorly affected by sanctions. Uh, the Canadian Association of Independent Schools and several of its members regularly recruit students from Russia. Um, also, Languages Canada um, conducted a recruitment visit to Moscow relatively recently in the fall of 2019. So, the recruitment activities also take place. Um, market entry consideration. Most Russians studying abroad, um, and this is important, are self-finance. Um, educational loans are not widespread here. Uh, one of the big reasons for that is that up till relatively recently higher education was free of charge so banks sometimes does not have even um, educational loans as a product um, education loans are few um, and they are only provided for students studying um, at Russian universities um, there is just one governmental scholarship so-called presidential grant that covers um, study abroad programs but it has serious limitations for instance, it covers just one year of studying abroad, uh, regardless of the duration of the program. Uh, parents are the main influencers when determining a study destination, especially if we're talking about uh, bachelor's program, short-term programs. How the students and agents also play um, an important role. Um, there are many, many education agencies active in Russia. This is a very um, agency's market, I would say. They render a variety of services to the students. Uh, they advise on the uh, school or university. They help with um, filling in um, visa applications. They're helping with application packages. Sometimes they even book um, air tickets to students. So their services are in great demand. Some of them specifically uh, focus on specific markets, others represent educational institutions from uh, multiple countries, uh, many offer English testing services. Um, more of market entry considerations. Um, uh, Russians, uh, uh, internet is very widespread, over 75% of people using it on a regular basis with 35% using it from mobile devices, Wi-Fi is everywhere in big cities. Um, the Moscow city metro was the first to launch free Wi-Fi, even on trains. Uh, Russia has its own versions of Google and Facebook, uh, which is not to say that Google and Facebook are unpopular or not used here, but there's some uh, Russian versions um, Yandex and Kontakti, which are also very popular and heavily used by um, young generation. Um, so, um, as for the market strategies, um, entry strategies, the general advice would be to visit Russia at least once a year. Of course, now with the borders closed and this um, unpredictable situation, it's hard to give this kind of advice. However, when it's back to normal, um, visits um, to the country are recommended. Uh, have promotional materials in Russian. Get Russian translation services. Establish connections with local education agencies, uh, which can um, also render various services to schools and universities. Attend educational fairs and um, visit schools with uh, various promotion activities. Use local versions of social media, which I mentioned earlier. 
Um, on the key education events, um, I would like to take this opportunity and advise, um, invite um, all of you for those um, um, who haven't registered to uh, register and attend our Edu Canada virtual fair event, which will take place um, in the beginning of November. Uh, there are also many uh, fairs um, organized by one of the key players on the Russian market, which is Begin Group. They do both offline and online events. Now, of course, it's completely online, but um, um, hopefully they will uh, resume the, online, uh, the offline events as well. Um, also, uh, two uh, big Russian agencies, Students International and ITA Group, have their own um, events, which they list on their websites. And also, this is this um, International College Fair that also um, SRT International College Fair, which also has um, a bunch of events going on. Um, key sources of information listed here for your interest, Canadian Canada Eurasia Russia Business Council, Federation of Education and Language uh, Consultors Association, and Study in Russia, which is a website uh, designed by the Russian Minister of Education and has a good comprehensive information on the Russian education system as well as on universities who are looking for international partnerships. Um, with this, I encourage you also to connect with Trade Commissioner Services. Uh, um, we are always uh, happy to help you and to handle all your requests, so please feel free to contact us. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and to give floor to another speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, now I'd like to invite Nathan back uh, and uh, to inter give us introduction to the Kazakhstan market. Perfect. Okay, um, I will follow. Oh, when it loads, I will follow a, a similar format to uh, Alexandra. So um, there, there won't be a lot of surprises in terms of the uh, style. Um, I am going to speak uh, primarily about Kazakhstan, uh, the Embassy of Canada here. We also cover uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, um, and I'll briefly mention why I'm not going to talk about them. But uh, to begin with, um, just some of the, the overall facts. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, actually, uh, in, in geography and climate between Kazakhstan and Canada. It's a, a relatively large country with a relatively small population den uh, density. Um, what might be of uh, note uh, to, uh, to you is that it has a relatively low rate of urban population. Uh, it is still uh, quite rural compared to OECD countries, but that's offset by the fact that it is a quite young country. So you can see of a population of 18 million, roughly seven and a half are younger than 24 years old. So that is um, you know, of importance when you're looking at uh, potential students. In terms of the largest cities, cities that might be worth visiting, um, the big two are Almaty, which uh, used to be the capital. It is in the southeast. Um, it is still the commercial center of Kazakhstan. Um, but we're seeing an increasing movement uh, of commerce and certainly the political power to Nur Sultan, which is the new capital and uh, formerly known as Astana, if people have uh, been out in this part of the world over the last, uh, well, two, three years ago. Um, Shimkent is the third largest city. It's about a million people. But if, uh, if you are venturing off of the Elmati Nur Sultan path, what might be of more interest is actually Atrau, which is on the far west side of Kazakhstan. And that is because it's an important oil and gas center. Uh, the economy here is really driven by oil and gas and mining uh, commodity prices. And so um, that is where there is a bit of a nucleus of a middle class. And so that might be of interest as well. I won't go over the, um, the other numbers in here, uh, except to say that um, when looking at other Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan is by, by far the, the most developed, uh, the, the wealthiest, uh, especially on a GDP per capita basis. Um, I'm not going to get into Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan very much at all. Um, originally, when I was drafting this up, I, I thought I might uh, look at exploring Kyrgyzstan. 
I, I've pulled the numbers in terms of uh, students from Kyrgyzstan that actually came to Canada uh, with study permits in 2019, um, and it was a total of 35. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is currently experiencing a resurgence of COVID-19 uh, cases, and also going through some, some pretty significant political turmoil right now. So probably not uh, a viable target, for at least for the short term. Tajikistan is, is um, an even uh, smaller uh, country in terms of, of an education market. Um, and so uh, I'll skip past those. Um, but if people have questions, of course, happy to, to answer them. In terms of the education system in Kazakhstan, it is a centralized education system uh, that is overseen by the Ministry of Education. Well, regions and districts are responsible for local implementation. Uh, they do not have the same amount of autonomy as, uh, as you would see in, in Western countries or in OECD countries. Uh, there is mandatory basic general education for ages 6 uh, to 15. This is near universal. And we are seeing an increasing uh, rate of completion for general secondary education. So what was 32% in 2001 has almost doubled uh, by 2015. The uh, next slide kind of gives you that same sort of layout in terms of the number of uh, schools um, and, and uh, students in them. What I would note on this, uh, I would just note two things. One is that there is a thriving uh, private uh, industry for these schools, particularly at preschool um, and the uh, technical vocational institutions, um, as well as at the university level. Um, for the university level, there's been an effort to try to strengthen the quality of, in, uh, of education. Um, and there's been an effort to do that by closing or merging universities. Uh, what that's meant in, in reality is that the number of uh, around 130 has stayed static uh, for the last uh, eight years or so. So the current system uh, is very similar to the Russian model. Um, primary and secondary school include 11 years of study. Um, Kazakhstan has been trying or planning to move towards a 12-year uh, system, similar to what we have in uh, many parts of Canada. Um, and uh, originally, this was to be in effect, I believe it was two years ago. Uh, the current target date is uh, 2021. But with the current state of affairs in the world and in Kazakhstan, I would not be surprised to see that get bumped. Um, the other point I would like to speak about quickly on this slide is um, the fact that there's a uh, change in the language of instruction. Um, by 2017, over half of the general day schools were offering instruction in Kazakh. Uh, well, 17.5% uh, 17 were offering instruction in Russian, and just under 30% uh, were offering a mix of Kazakh and uh, Russian instruction. What is happening is that there's a growth in the uh, Kazakh language influence in the school system. Um, and then the other thing I want to note here is that Kazakhstan is also pl placing a greater emphasis on English as a uh, foreign language and language of instruction in subjects related to science, technology, and engineering. Um, then uh, this is reflected in the fact that there's a growing number of students that are attending schools that are specialized um, and, and elite. Um, and so these schools teach uh, several subjects at advanced levels. The most prestigious of them are the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools, which are a network across, uh, across Kazakhstan, but there are others as well. These schools, despite the fact that they are attended by less than 1% of students, they actually receive more funding than the, uh, the other mainstream schools uh, combined. Um, this graph, I believe you'll get the presentations, this chart lays out the education system in a bit more detail, how they, they flow together. I won't go over that uh, today. You can look at it at your, at your leisure. Um, then the next thing I want to uh, point out is that despite uh, improvements in the, in the Kazakhstan education system, there do remain gaps. So there are performance gaps relative to OECD, um, particularly in, in mathematics is, is one that was uh, highlighted. Um, but then there's also access gaps um, between uh, urban students, uh, higher socioeconomic classes, and students from rural or lower socioeconomic households.
the, uh, the focus on the elite schools has further widened this gap. Um, and so that is something to keep in mind. The uh, next thing I want to mention here is that since 2012, <clears throat> Kazakhstan has embarked on a modernization drive to try to better align its uh, vocational education training and higher education system to actually meet labor market demand. Uh, this has been a problem um, for, for quite a while in Kazakhstan, and so they're, they're working on that. Um, to do it, they've granted greater autonomy to higher education institutions. And they've launched uh, pilot programs to try to encourage partnerships between those institutions and employers um, to try to modernize the training curriculum and to define occupational standards. However, despite that, employer surveys continue to point to the need to improve training programs uh, to, to get the workforce skills that they actually need in a, a modern and diversified economy. Uh, COVID-19. COVID-19 impact in Kazakhstan was, was sudden, it was drastic. Um, you know, it, when the, the hard quarantine happened in March, uh, schools shut down. Um, there was an attempt to roll out uh, online education. This proved quite problematic, um, especially in the rural areas, um, largely due to the fact that uh, broadband and high-speed internet were just wasn't there in a lot of these areas. And so trying to do something online didn't work for that reason. Um, the other problem is, is that uh, there's quite a bit of uh, an income divide between the, the haves and the have nots in Kazakhstan. And so there was a lack of needed connected devices, uh, again, for the rural and the uh, lower socioeconomic households. The um, Response to this, so the authorities have tried to address these problems. Um, they have transferred over 170,000 computers on a temporary basis to schools to try to, uh, to help with the online education uh, issue. Um, they've also provided IT training for a number of teachers, uh, but this is a fairly small number, just over a, a thousand uh, by the uh, end of the first half of 2020. They're working to try to improve the infrastructure of schools as well, but these aren't uh, quick fixes. And so what has happened in terms of the rollout of the new school year is that it's a bit of a hybrid model. So distance learning is being offered for preschool um, and for grades 1 to 11 using a mix of internet and uh, television. Uh, so there's certain channels that do lessons. Um, but in-person classes are being offered for grades 1 to 4, up to a maximum of 15 students. Um, when they're requested by parents. Now, that, that would sound like there wouldn't be that many of these classes, but in reality, um, official statistics indicate that 60% of primary students are studying in person. Um, in rural areas, uh, preschool grades 1 to 11, they're all being taught as usual, uh, subject to the, the local COVID-19 situation. And uh, higher education is being conducted remotely with exceptions for, for lab work or, or um, uh, practical work where you have to be on campus. Looking at international mobility, uh, Kazakhstan is a net exporter of students. Um, and so in 2018, the last year that we have data available, um, Kazakhstan welcomed roughly 14,000 students from abroad, um, but conversely sent out 83,500 uh, students. Um, What's driving that is that Kazakhstan is relatively wealthy within the region. It does have a emerging middle class that has allowed international education to be attainable uh, for more people. Um, and there's a recognition of the importance in education, both on the Kazakh government side um, and the business community, but uh, also in terms of Kazakhstani students who are looking at improving their quality of education uh, and their level of employability. Uh, I don't have statistics uh, for this last point I'm going to make here, but just anecdotally from going to fairs, there is an extremely high level of interest in, in migration and living abroad um, as well. So that, those are all driving factors. <clears throat> that all said, uh, the, um, the Kazakhstan student is, is price sensitive, and so this growth, this uh, number of students uh, is not uh, growing in a straight line. Um, it had, uh, well, you will see on my next slide, but um, after uh, several years of quite strong growth, 
um, the number of students studying outside of Kazakhstan dipped in 2017 and, and in 2018. So there's an expectation that demand for international education will continue, but the capacity to pay for it is, is likely to be impacted both by COVID-19 and by the drop in oil prices. So that is something to be aware of. This is the, um, the statistics uh, on a regional basis for outbound Kazakhstani uh, students. And so you can see the, the numbers I was mentioning there. On this, I'll just quickly say that uh, Russia is, is by far the preferred destination. Um, in uh, the most uh, recent numbers we have here, uh, around 70,000 uh, students were studying in Russia. Um, Kurdistan was next uh, at 5,000, um, well, just a little bit over 5,000. The US was just under 2,000, United Kingdom at 1,500. How Canada does? Uh, Canada um, is doing fairly good, frankly. Uh, we were 10th in the last data that I have, which was from 2016, but we know that our numbers have grown since then. So even though the, the overall total has dropped in 2017 and 2018, the number of students coming to Canada has continued to grow. Um, and uh, according to our internal, uh, well, according to uh, IRCC data, uh, for students uh, in Canada with uh, study permits in 2019, at the end of the year, it was uh, 1,195. When you look at uh, the UK and the US, that's not a bad, uh, that's not a bad number. So what is, what is making that happen? Why Canada? We have quite a positive reputation among uh, Kazakhstanis who are aware of Canada, but we remain less well known than both the United States and the United Kingdom, um, which have been the traditional uh, destinations for English language uh, studies. Um, <clears throat> what's happening around the world in terms of political developments has, has also uh, highlighted Canada's brand, and so has the uh, Canadian reputation for inclusion, diversity, as well as a, a familiar sort of geography and climate. Um, so Canada is seen as a safe and, and a stable destination with a high quality of life. Um, and like I kind of alluded to earlier, there is a lot of interest in longer term migration and postgraduation work opportunities. Um, one thing um, as well to point out here is that because the Kazakh and the Canadian economies have similar uh, natural resource uh, sides to them, there is complementary education programs. And so um, as Kazakhstan has placed more of an emphasis on vocational and professional uh, training, um, there is Canadian uh, programs obviously that, that match those needs. And it's kind of becoming top of mind for students when they're looking at their career opportunities. In terms of student recruitment and partnership, um, I'll try to limit myself. I know we're running a bit short on time here. So what I'll just say quickly is that we do see opportunities for all the sectors, K-12, college, university, and language. Where there is a very low opportunity would be uh, French language training. There's just little interest or demand for French language skills in, in the educational sector or in the, the job market here. And where there is a higher uh, level of, of opportunity probably is in the college and polytechnic side, where for price sensitive students, uh, college presents a, a high value proposition in terms of bank for buck. Uh, and the open work permit also remains a, a strong attraction. That isn't to say there isn't opportunities in uh, secondary schools, in universities, and in English language. It's just that the other, uh, the other two are outliers. Four partnerships. Um, so as Kazakhstan has uh, been pushing for its modernization drive, the government has been encouraging institutions to do uh, partnership programs. Um, Kazakhstani, uh, Kazakhstani institutions are also quite interested in these. They're, they're very keen for them. The trick and the problem here is making sure that the uh, agreement, the partnership, isn't something that is just signed as an MOU and then uh, lies dormant, but rather to make it turn into something concrete, whether it's a uh, dual degree or an exchange of some type. And so one thing I would uh, just caution people to keep in mind is who your partners uh, are and how engaged they are and how much you trust that they'll actually do the follow-up and the concrete work necessary to make something uh, more valuable come out of it. For market entry, um, the key here is to be present. 
Um, you need to be in the market. Uh, I mean, obviously, that's uh, that's difficult right now. Um, but it is quite important to be here to attend education fairs, to conduct school visits, and to meet agents. Uh, it is a trust-based sort of system. Uh, local education agents are very important influencers, uh, particularly in terms of uh, convincing parents that uh, that the decision that the student is making is the right decision for them. And so this. Uh, relationship that you can build with agents here is is quite important and quite valuable. Um, despite the fact uh, that I was mentioning earlier um, about the growing importance of Kazakh uh, language, the the language that is the most valuable at the education fairs uh, and at the uh, events here is still Russian. And so having your promotional material in Russian, uh, doing uh, social media in Russian, having Russian translation when you're attending a event here or, or being a Russian speaker is, is incredibly valued. That, that might change uh, as uh, Kazakh becomes more and more prevalent, but keep in mind that uh, most of the parents right now, uh, Russian was their first language. And so that is the, the language that you should keep in mind in terms of being able to communicate your, uh, your advantages clearly. Um, you might want to promote academic areas where Canada has a particular advantage that matches the Kazakh economy. So again, agriculture, mining, oil and gas, digital industries, uh, clean tech, for example. Uh, and then, of course, the, um, the uh, programs that allow for uh, postgraduate work were also very popular. In terms of upcoming events, um, there is, I, I won't spend too much time on this. I'll just note that Kazakhstan is part of, uh, we are part of that education fair uh, that was mentioned previously. And so do keep us in mind for that. Um, and Begin Group is also operating here in Kazakhstan, and so they have an event coming up for uh, for our market in uh, on November third, I believe it is. Uh, most of the fairs and events that, as the embassy, we participated in were being handled by local education agents. These froze for quite some time. They're starting up again now, um, and they're also I, I believe there will be some more uh, virtual fairs coming up as well. So watch this space. But the two events that I would flag for now are uh, these, uh, these ones on, on the list. Um, finally, I will leave this up for just for a little bit um, because I really do encourage you to reach out to me directly. Uh, I'm always happy to chat. I'm always happy to give you uh, a more tailored sort of uh, advice uh, for, uh, for market entry to Kazakhstan for your institution. Um, and of course, if you are looking for connections with an agent here, we do have that, uh, that information as well. Um, so uh, yeah, that is my email. And that is it. And I will turn it over. And I believe Q&As are next.